Aloha, Grant uh, Machisige, we have you here today. How are you today? Hey, I'm doing great today. Good to be here. Where are you at? You're up uh, 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 Hawaii, right? No, I live out in Waimea. I didn't. I, where do you live? I live out on White Road. Oh, you know, I totally, uh, again, the things I <laughs> learn. It's like, wait a minute, you know, you're driving all the way from Kohala way to get here and stuff. I did, I did not realize that. Yes. So, Grant, we are here to talk about you, not uh -oh. to talk about anybody else, <laughs> and to talk about your exploits, um, you know, uh, primarily as a biker. And maybe we can talk a little bit about I'm so confused about gravel bikes and I mean I can tell you my history but mountain bikes used to be pretty simple it used to be first bike that I had was a mongoose the second bike I had was a stump jumper sport oh so Two where good bikes where did you grow up you grew up in Hawaii yeah I, I grew up on Oahu uh, in uh, Wahewa in the middle of Oahu yeah um, and my grandparents lived in a plantation camp uh, a few miles outside of Waihewa uh, called Pomoho Camp. Okay, so they knew their uh, Banco number and stuff, yeah? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, so you're driving to Haleiwa, yeah. and uh, on the way there, just before the Dole uh, pineapple stand, Yeah. There's a small little plantation town that was off. You would you would just drive right past it without even really knowing it's there. But uh, yeah, you know that's where I grew up, literally in the middle of the pineapple fields, uh, running around, you know, getting dirty, getting muddy. <laughs> yeah, that's what we do. trees, digging holes. Yeah, that's. I, I was lucky enough to do the Dick Evans race and to always do the Honolulu Century Advertiser, the hundred. Oh, and okay. And vis visit the neighborhoods. Right. <laughs> yeah. So that's yeah. That's where I grew up on Oahu, uh, and um, uh, I would spend my summers out here on the Big Island at my aunt and uncle's house uh, here in Waimea from probably. The late 60s, early 70s, I'd, I'd be coming out here every summer and spending the summer here uh, because my aunt was a school teacher, so she had the summers off. Oh, okay. So this was my playground growing up. <laughs> Still is now. It is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so where'd, you, where'd you go to high school? I went to Lelehua High School uh, yeah. over there in Wahiwa. Yeah. Did you do sports when you were in high school and stuff? Uh, I ran a little bit of track, but not much. Uh, I I got bored re really quick, and uh, I got into cars and motorcycles. Uh, um, so I hung out with the motorheads and really played around with, uh, you know, tinkered with motorized things. I was also in the band, so, you know, I, I played the French horn in high school. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Another uh, talent. <laughs> so through all of that, yeah, I used to ride motorcycles, play with cars, uh, um, and that's when I rode a 10-speed everywhere I went because I couldn't drive before I had my license, yeah. and then I got into BMX bikes, so I was racing BMX bikes for a little while because they're a lot cheaper than motorcycles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. what was it, do you remember what your 10-speed was, what brand? So uh, it was a Schwinn Latour. Oh, yeah. I used to have a green Schwinn. I can't remember the model number, though. Yeah. Everyone had uh, the Schwinn Varsity and the Schwinn Continental, I believe. Oh, that, that, that was the one that I had. It was the, the, yeah, was the, I, the Schwinn Continental. When I, yeah. When I went looking, uh, they had just come out with the Latour, and I got the Latour because it was, you know, it was high end back then. Oh yeah, Lightweight, chromoly frame, I think, uh, but for sure aluminum rims. <laughs> oh, sad story on mine. Mine got stolen. So, yeah. <laughs> and then it, you were you were uh, racing too. You were doing. Uh, I raced, yeah, I raced BMX for a few years uh, out there on Oahu. 
Yeah, plenty of BMX areas and stuff, if I remember correctly, too. Yeah. You can go out and uh, just kind of cruise. And, and back in those days, I'm not going to date you, but back when I was, because I was on Oahu, I was working at Koala Basin Marine Mammal Lab back in uh -huh. the day. Uh, cyclists, we were so kind of rare on the roads that people actually paid attention to us. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. I remember doing the uh, the advertiser century for many, 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 many years. Uh, yeah, that was there was another race too. There was a hundred uh, uh, K race too. I can't remember the name of it though. Yeah, I don't remember that one. Yeah, <laughs> my 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 story, which I've told before here, is uh, that uh, I was headed out, you know, where you go up Diamond Head on the bike ride, and there was a lady who fell down in front of me, and instead of hitting her, I went over her, landed on my handlebars, learned uh, learned why handlebars have grips, so you don't uh -huh. take a core, core sample out, right. and <laughs> ended up with a, a pretty good hematoma eventually, but that's, uh -huh. that's an old story. <laughs> That was a great race. I missed that race. I, they still do it. Yeah. Of course, I haven't heard any plans. Uh, I know Honolulu um, Marathon is still kind of uh, hedging their bets, you know, as we're in COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Right. In fact, they had just, I saw a post where they were looking for uh, volunteer runners on July 3rd, maybe to practice um, a corral start, you know, where you, you could space people out and stuff like that. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, people, you know, are coming up with all kinds of stuff. As far as any races on, uh, or any organized rides on the island, HCC and Coffee Talk riders have just restarted their rides, right? I think uh, Bruce just went out on his, uh, on the Coffee Talk riders this past weekend. Otherwise, yeah, I don't know what's happening with the uh, off the the road bike scene, uh, or I should call it the off dirt riding scene. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. So, when was that? Like the first time you can remember, um, you know, out on a mountain bike, you know, going out and just going off on a single track trail. Um, so. Um, Going back then, uh, you know, in history a little bit. Uh, so I had a, you know, I've always had a road bike. Uh, and when I left for college back in 1982, I basically took a dumpster Huffy that I found and modified it so it would be much more capable in a college environment. And I took it with me to school. Where'd you go to, where'd you go to college? I went to DeVry Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. Oh, see, I grew up in Chicago where DeVry started. Yes, exactly. Yeah. As, uh, um, what was the name of it? Uh, Bell and Howell was yeah. the original. Yes. So um, I left my good road bike behind and I uh, left my BMX racing bike behind and I brought a, a cheap old Huffy with me that I used extensively uh, while in uh, college. Then when I graduated, I moved to California. And that's when a, uh, you know, a high school buddy of mine uh, was living there. He and I went and looked at bike shops again, just for the hell of it. And yeah. uh, because you know, we had been out of the bike scene for a number of years and uh, I still rode, rode bikes from time to time. Um, and that's when I saw my first mountain bike in 1985. I went into a bike shop and uh, my buddy and I both said, whoa, look at that. Was that's it like, like a, a Trek maybe? Uh, it was a specialized, uh, yeah. in his case, a stump jumper. And mine was a mongoose. Uh, because I used to race a mongoose uh, BMX bike when I first started racing. Uh, so, you know, I, I held on to that. Uh, and that's when I said, we got to get those things, man. That's like a grown up BMX bike. And let's see, back in the day, they were probably $500, 400. Yes. Yeah. $500, uh, 15 speed, uh, 
crappy tires, crappy brakes, but we had so much fun on the, on those things. And we explored single track right away. And we and realized how hard it was. And mostly in California, that's probably the water district roads and stuff. Well, uh, I was lucky enough to live in, in the Redondo Beach, Hermosa Beach area. So uh, close by, 20 minutes away was Palos Verdes, and we had a whole bunch of trails up there. So we didn't have to go very far. And it was a great place to learn how to mountain bike uh, because everything is either straight up, straight down, uh, very technical. So uh, yeah, you know, I learned real quick. And then I still had my road bike, so about every month I was doing a century somewhere. Yeah. You know, during the summer months, there's a century, you know, every month. And uh, during the spring and fall, there was the Solvang century that went from oh. Solvang yeah. up to Santa Maria and back. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I was doing a lot of road biking then. Um, but the mountain biking was so much more fun on the weekends. Can you remember your first... Um what did what did they call it? DIY? Uh, do your own um, uh, modification to your, your mountain bike. Hmm. You know, I already knew how to uh, how to work on bikes because in high school I also worked at a bike shop. I worked on motorcycles. I worked on cars. So tinkering and modifying things weren't you know a big deal for me. So. For me, the biggest deal was uh, at the times the tires were crap, so I was modifying tires. The gears weren't so good, so I was, you know, trying to figure out how to get uh, better gears so that I could climb better, do more climbing, and, you know, uh, realizing that it wasn't all about the speed, because on a road bike, you, you could spin in a higher gear for a longer time, but... On a mountain bike, you don't need that kind of stuff. So, so you're probably about, you're probably swapping out uh, uh, road bike gears onto a mountain bike. It was actually trying to figure out where I could find pieces in uh, the backs of old bike shops and everything, and figure out how to get the gears to be lower. And then, of course, the brakes were always junk. So you know, <laughs> brakes, was, we don't need brakes. <laughs> was there uh, were you with a yeah uh, i'm guessing that it was just you and your buddies uh, going out and it wasn't any kind of organized club or anything like that yeah so uh it it started off as that because we didn't have the internet so it was just he and myself going out and exploring and finding trails because mountain biking wasn't a big thing then and uh one day we're out riding and we had just uh, pushed our bike up a certain hill that we weren't capable of riding. And this older gentleman comes riding up the hill that we just pushed our bike up. And, you know, he's, a, he's breathing a little hard, but not really that bad. And, you know, it's just a really nice dude. And, you know, he goes, hey, guys, how are you doing? And we're saying, yeah, you know, great. And, we're just kind of exploring trails and he said hey you know there's a group that meets up here at the top uh of this del soro park uh, we ride every sunday meet here at nine so i you know i met up with him and uh we started riding every sunday it turns out he owned a bike shop oh. and <laughs> he was he was you know he, he was the nicest dude uh, you know, you could meet, the, he didn't care what you were riding, where you bought the bike from. All he cared was that you were out having fun and, you know, having a good time. And to this day, he's one of my best buddies. You know, we ride together as much as we can. We, we try to get together every year and ride. And we've been doing these mountain bike trips since the late 80s, early 90s. We travel somewhere for you know two to three weeks and we mountain bike for uh you know two to three weeks oh wow and it's instead of taking us taking a ski trip during the summer i mean the winters we go out and we mountain bike for two to three weeks perfect that's that's great do you remember uh, uh they used to have these uh they were uh, the gearing that was like a, an oval 
yeah, they were called Biopace. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, I remember those. Okay. I put those on one of my mountain bikes, and as it turned out, they're allegedly now they discovered that they're bad for your knees. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> and here it is now. That, you know that's the popular thing in, on a lot of people's bikes is uh, they've come out with new a new version of oval chain rings. Really? I, you know, yeah. I'm totally out of the loop when it comes to yeah. you know the bike stuff. So it's like. <laughs> And we used to have guys uh, at the, we used to do a ride in uh, Grand Junction, Colorado. The oh, yeah. Tour of the, Tour of the Valley Century ride. Uh-huh. And at the expo afterwards, there would, always, or there would always be, they'd hire some dude who had one of the bikes where you could pedal backwards and they'd be jumping up uh, on, you know, like railroad ties and, and oh, okay. tables yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Was that something you did? No, I was never that. I, I wish I had those skills. <laughs> Can you remember any uh, notable encounters since you were in California out on the trails with any critters? Um, I do see, you know, I did see rattlesnakes uh, from time to time. Uh, I had always said that I was the one that was going to get bit because I was never the first one through the trail. <laughs> And the first one that went through was going to piss that snake off and I was going to come through and I was going to get bit. Never happened, but it's still a fear of mine. Well, knock on wood, you know. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so you never ran into any mountain lions or cougars or anything, bobcats? I've seen them in the distance uh, out on some of the remote trails, but not uh, in the Palos Verdes area. Yeah, we're we're kind of uh, we're very blessed here. There's oh, yeah. uh, the only things that can eat, only animals that can eat us are in the water. <laughs> <laughs> so when you uh, you're in California and you're mountain biking and starting to learn how to, you know, the, your basically your skills and stuff. Did you have any like ambitions to do? Uh, were there races, organized races and stuff? Uh, there were, but I didn't participate in them uh, then. Um, and the writing I did really uh, that pushed the skills were just trying to challenge ourselves to see if we could get up or down these particular sections of trails. Uh, and you're riding with your friends, so you're out there and you're having a good time. And, you know, there's 10 of you there and, you know, you all try it and sometimes you make it and sometimes you don't. And, uh, there were also these extended, really long technical climbs uh, that we uh, try to see if uh, we could accomplish the climb without stopping or putting your foot down. Or so those were the challenges. Yeah, and uh, so as as your friends and you were getting better and stuff, were there uh, like younger uh, kikis coming in that you guys were teaching and stuff? Um, yeah, yeah, it was, and it was fun because, uh, you know, I, again, the, the learning curve is steep there. Uh, and it, you know, it, as usual or as always, it's, you know, it's always been about the enthusiasm. Um, you know, mountain biking is like that where you can spend a lot of time sitting around and talking with each other and, and seeing what, uh, you know, can and can't be accomplished. And back then there was no Strava, so no, <laughs> <laughs> nothing happened. <laughs> right. <laughs> so after uh, you know you were uh, uh, cruising around California and stuff for a while, what what brought you back to Hawaii? Why did you decide to come back? Was it work? Was it? Uh... Yeah, I, I was working in the aerospace industry uh, through that time from 1985 until 1992. Things were good, but uh, I was starting to realize that it was just really getting crowded and there were a lot of disgruntled, unhappy people. Uh, there were some people starting to get laid off because uh, the economy was, was starting to come down again and aerospace was starting to get iffy. And I just said, you know, 
my plan was never to leave Hawaii. I, you know, I've always wanted to live in Hawaii and I never thought I would ever leave in the first place. So it was just time to start looking and find a job back home that I could use my technical skills. Were you working for, I had a friend that she used to work for General Dynamics. Uh Uh-huh. I worked for Hughes Aircraft Company. Oh, okay. I had had another friend that worked for Hughes, a lady named Stormy. Hmm. Now, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's just, so, so I worked for Radar Systems, uh, one division of Hughes, uh, and we were, when I started there, we were nine, uh, 12,000 people just in, just in Radar Systems, and then when I left, we were down to 9,000 people. <laughs> Which, wow, yeah, for uh, budget cutbacks and stuff? Yeah, but you know, it was a, my my boss who was also from Hawaii had put a really great crew of people together. We were in a really neat little niche where we were building uh, test equipment for radar systems. Oh. So the, the test equipment that we built uh, would hook up to the radar systems and we literally would test the radar before it went out the door, uh, you know, as part of the production line or we built the test equipment that would get installed into the Air Force bases out across uh, the the world because uh, they needed to test their radars before they put them back into an airplane to make sure things worked right. Yeah, wow, that's, that, I had no idea that you were at that level and stuff. So you guys, you, you probably didn't calibrate it, you probably just made sure that it worked, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, that was the big thing was, did it work or did it play nicely with the other pieces? Because the radar system was made up of, uh, I think it was nine pieces. So you had to make sure when you put one in, it was going to be working with all the rest of the pieces and not be uh, dependent on some sort of calibration or adjustment. So quality control, and uh, do you find that uh, maybe at night you glow in the dark a little bit now, or? (laughs) Good old microwaves. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I remember I was working at a place where they had one of the first microwave ovens, and uh, a lot of the workers were like, they would put stuff in and then run away. Is that right? Yeah, because they figured they'd get zapped. Oh. (laughs) And then, yeah, oh yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, in a couple of places, I've installed uh, Hughes satellite dishes. Oh. And, and uh, I, I did have to tell some of the guys, no, dude, you do not stand in right front. underneath the satellite dish because it's right. transmitting, you know. Yeah. It's a space, basically. So you do, want, do you not want to have those waves go through you. <laughs> Yeah, I had some friends that worked for uh, Space and Communications, Space and Com. So they worked on the, uh, the the satellite equipment. Oh, back in the day, that's what we remember back here on the Big Island when the fastest internet we had was AOL. <laughs> dial up at AOL used to I used to call in Honolulu to get the best dial up, and it was a long distance phone call back then. Right. <laughs> So you come back to the, the, the Big Island here. Did you have a job when you came back or was it just, I'm going to come back and get a job? Yeah, this was the job I came back to. You know, I, um, 1991, we had the uh, solar eclipse here. Yeah. And I came back uh, with some friends from California because I said, hey, let's go visit the Big Island. They're going to have a solar eclipse. And there was no hotel rooms available, no run of cars available. But it was no big deal because I'm going to stay at my aunt and uncle's house. We have a car to use, bedrooms to use. So we come here and we're checking out the solar eclipse and, you know, all the things leading up to it. And I realized there's observatories here. Up to that point, I was interviewing at UH Manoa to try and get jobs at the geophysics uh, department or the physics or, you know, I was I was thinking that's the only place I'd be able to get a high-tech job and 
that's when I realized, hey, there's observatories here. They must have a lot of things that need to be fixed. <laughs> I don't know anything about telescopes. You know, I, I, I understand the basic fundamental. It collects light, it re, you know, refocuses light and, you know, you put a camera there or you look through it, you know, and with your eyeballs and everything. But beyond that, I said, what, you know, how complicated can it be? <laughs> Full time job. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I I wrote a whole bunch of letters and tried to get uh, in contact with a lot of different people and managed to find this job at the Canada France Hawaii Telescope Corporation. Do you remember where you were where you spent uh, the eclipse thing? I was actually I was down at uh, over by you know where they built the uh, Loretta lens that roundhouse that they never finished. Which, where is that at? Um, oh, what's it's the beaches south of uh, of uh, Waikoloa, and and there's okay. a there's a road that goes down there. You had to have uh, access, you had to have keys to get into through the gates and stuff. And she, uh, uh -huh. Earl Bakken, uh, the oh, yeah, yeah, they ended up by Bakken's house and stuff. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, that's where we went down. We went down on the beach to you yeah. know, watch the eclipse, yeah. I was uh, probably about 200 yards uh, above Kauai High Village on Kauai High Road. I was looking for a good spot. I, you know, everything was kind of clouded out and I was driving back up Kauai High Road a little ways and I said, this is perfect. I'm stopping right here. <laughs> it worked out perfect. Did you, say, did you take any photos at the time? Do you remember? Yeah, I have some uh, uh, pictures somewhere. <laughs> Back on the film, right? Yeah, so I still have the negatives and the pictures somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so as you're getting a job at Canada France and stuff, you're still biking though, yeah? Yeah. So I still had my road bike. I still had my mountain bike. And uh, I was taking trips everywhere with my mountain bike when I still lived in... Uh, California. Uh, it was easy to do road trips everywhere. Um, and, you know, again, mountain biking was still kind of new, even though it had been around for a little while. Uh, we weren't recognized out there. Yeah, yeah. You if know, you were on a bike, you were a, a biker or a cyclist, but they yeah. didn't think the difference between road and mountain bike. Yeah, the big mountain bike, you know, uh, destination places were like Mammoth Mountain, Big Bear, you know, the ski resorts for the summer. But there weren't uh, many other places you could go to mountain bike. So there was a lot of exploring. And that's really what I love about mountain biking is hopping on, a, a, you know, it, it's like taking a road bike on an old, uh, old highway and just kind of seeing where it goes and where it takes you. And But mountain biking, you do it on trails. So Do you ever go out to Moab? You ever go out to that Utah? That's one of the places I've never been to. Moab. Oh, dude. I've just never gotten there, but uh, I've been to Brian Head. Yeah. Uh, you know, um so there you know, I've I've mountain biked out there. Uh um yeah, I've been to so many other places. I've just never made it to uh Moab yet. And I was actually uh, a hiker and a runner out there before the mountain bike craves started uh -huh. and stuff. I still remember, I've told the story before, but I still remember I was with a, a group of high school kids. We were doing a week-long uh, backpacking trip, and we saw one of the local town kids dragging his bike over areas, and he had one of those uh, banana seat bikes. Yeah, and he he would come over and just ride off on the trail. And at the time, we looked and it was like, "Wow, that that'd be pretty neat." So he predated mountain biking, so to speak. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, there was you know, that, that's that's back when uh, we were playing around with uh, regular bikes because I had yeah. like a Schwinn twenty incher, uh, you know, a single speed part. Try to put gears on them and try to uh -huh. see where we could go. And you were totally right. The tires were all junk. Yeah. 
and back back then too, there were some people that were going out on uh, in the winter time and putting you know uh, screws in yeah. their tires. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, something we don't have to worry about in Hawaii very much about biking on ice. Right. <laughs> so when did your and, and and I've said, said this to other people that you are KOM, King of the Mountain, when it comes to trail maintenance. <laughs> you are definitely, you, you thank you so much for all the work that you do. But when did you start making uh, a really a concerted effort towards cleaning up the trails? Was it from self-interest? Mostly. Uh, so, you know, I've been writing what little trails we have around here. And for years, the popular places were Kulani because there's an avid group that meets there every Friday uh, to ride in the evening. And what little trails we have in Coloco area. And then we had that, you know, I living here, I found that Colopa area. But, uh, you know, again, the trails just weren't in that great shape. And I just started riding there more and more and more. And I just started saying, you know, I need to take care of this tree or take care of that tree because, uh, you know, I just, I just enjoy riding just as much as anybody else out there. And I, I put it this way, you know, in, in the 30 plus years I've been mountain biking, I've been fortunate enough to ride all over the world. You know, yeah. I'll just name a few, New Zealand, Switzerland, BC, Canada, uh, uh, Victoria, Vancouver Island, um, you know, all over Colorado, parts of Idaho, parts of Washington, just to name a few. Wow. And in those places, I've ridden thousands and thousands of miles of trails. So someone's taking care of all of these trails where I don't have to get off every, you know, 10 feet, every 20 feet because a tree has fallen down or something's blocking the trail here or there. People have taken care of these trails. So I appreciate that just as much as anybody else. So because I live close to Kalopa, I ride those trails a lot. So I take care of those trails because I don't want to have to get off my bike to carry it over some tree that came down. And we're fortunate enough that people come from all over the road to ride our trails. We're not like a mountain bike park or we're not like a mountain bike destination like Tahoe or, you know, St. George or Moab. Yeah. But people come from all over the road and they want to ride mountain bikes and they come out and they ride Kalopa, for example, and they say, oh my God, that's some of the best trails I've ridden anywhere. And you know, that's what it's all about. It's, it's just trying to give back. So uh, it's a, it's aloha. It's, you know, people say, well, you guys are so, you do it as a matter of course, I think. Right. And I've had a lot of help over the years. It's not just me. You know, there's a lot of people that, that just don't put it out there. They do a lot of work up there. They just have never said anything or they never, you know, they, they don't call recognition to themselves. And we have that Facebook page called Big Island Mountain Biking. And I put that together because here I live in Waimea and there's an east side of mountain biking, uh, you know, from the Hilo group. And there's a west side, you know, the Kona group. And I said, we have one big giant island. Why can't we all get together and, and share information on, you know, what are the conditions of the trails? What needs work? Where are we riding this weekend? And that's what it's all about is, is being able to share this information. And that's why I put it all out there so that people can know that, hey, these trails need work or these trails are in good shape now. They're, you know, you should get it now while the conditions are in, you know, are ideal. So, you know, that's what I'm trying to do is just trying to get collectively the island as a resource together for mountain biking. Yeah, I think, it, you know, uh, the reason that some of us post you or me or whoever is kind of, uh, I guess, to set an example, but to show people what's needed. You know, it's not about us. 
you know, we're just out there doing our, doing our thing and everything, but it's to like, maybe if I do it, it creates a little ripple that will carry on and somebody else will do it and somebody else can help here and somebody else can help here. I know on a national basis, there's a lot of uh, trail maintenance groups yep. connected with mountain biking, not so much with running, unfortunately, right. but certainly with mountain biking. And they are the ones that are the stewards of the, the trails where you guys, and uh, yeah, it's self-interest to a certain extent, but it's also, you know, giving back to the community. Mm-hmm. Right. And again, because people do come from all over the world and are able to enjoy what we have, you know, and I call it the aloha spirit, right? Uh, you don't have to be born in Hawaii. You don't have to be from Hawaii. Uh, but if you know it, you know, you got it and you share it and then you can go everywhere in the road and, and spread it and share it, the aloha spirit. Yeah. No, absolutely. And we're lucky enough to have some great people who own uh, bike stores here. Uh, uh, Grant and Janet uh, Miller, yep. who you guys went out for a ride yesterday. And uh -huh. they, they just have the, they bought, took over Matt's store up here in Waimea, you know, yep. and it's, it's uh, Bike Works Malka. And yep. they do so much for the community that has nothing to do with their business, really. Absolutely. Right. How was your How was the ride yesterday? It was good. Uh, you know, trying to trying to keep up and follow with Grant Miller is always going to be a challenge. <laughs> uh, you know, I I I ride with another guy. You know, that buddy that I know from California, like I said, that owned that bike shop. He's going to be seventy six this year, and I still can't keep up with him. <laughs> it's all about and, the gearing, right? Uh, I use that, you know, well, he, he calls it time in the saddle, you know, and uh, he calls it tits. Everyone <laughs> wants more uh, time in the saddle. And I keep saying if I could catch him, I'd kill him. <laughs> but, well, that's uh, like uh, road runners have the uh, time on feet. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, but, but it's, uh, it's always good. Uh, it's always nice riding with him, and it was great to see Janet out there because Janet hadn't been out on a mountain bike in quite some time. So she had a brand new bike, uh, and uh, you know, it was just great to be out sharing the you know the time with her and the rest of the gang. You were up at uh, uh, Kalopo, right? Yeah, Kalopo. Uh, no, we were up at uh, Puva Va. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I forgot. Yeah. So can you explain, since you brought up she has a new bike and stuff, I mean, like I said, back in the day, it was a stump jumper sport. It was a mongoose. It was a track. Uh -huh. Tracks were great because they were like kind of low center of gravity. Right. And now there's bikes. I saw the head family. I saw Jacob, you know, and his wife and daughter. And I, to be honest, I would not, I have no idea what their bikes were. Were they, I think they were gravel bikes. Can you maybe talk a little bit about what gravel bikes are supposed to be? Um, boy, uh, you know, again, that's, that's an area that I'm not uh, too familiar because I don't own one. I don't <laughs> ride one, but here's my take on it. Uh, back in the day, I'll go back in history a little bit. Uh, the first the first mountain bikes were uh, retrofitted uh, 50s era uh, cruiser bikes, Excelsior, if you recognize Schwinn Excelsiors. Yeah. Uh, but the people that rode them were, uh, were road bikers out in the Montana area. And they were looking for something to get away from road biking just as something different, something, you know, because riding on the road, you know, the hills in the Montana area was fun as a competitive thing, but they wanted something a little bit more recreational. So they went and started racing downhill on these modified Schwinn Excelsiors uh, as best as they could but they kept breaking everything, <laughs> including the frames. And at some point you run out of frames that can be found because these are 50s era 
bikes in the 70s, I believe. Yeah, 70s. So uh, if I remember right, it was Joe Breeze. Uh, yeah. And, uh, oh, I can't remember. Tom Ritchie, Gary Fisher, those yeah. guys who started mountain biking. They basically welded up their own custom frames. Uh, but it was very similar to road bike geometry. Yeah. But the difference is, it was basically a road bike frame that could take the fatter tires that uh, were available at the time from the cruisers. So there's your first gravel bike, so to speak, I guess. It was basically adapted road bike geometries to mountain bikes. Yeah. And for, for years and years and years, you had the road bike and you have the mountain bike and they went like this. Because road bikes were all about incredible efficiency on a road a mountain bike was about going off road and be, and finding the more gnarly 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 type conditions but somewhere in the middle there's a lot of gravel a lot of dirt roads like mono road yeah yeah and on mono road you don't necessarily need the gnarliest kind of mountain bike you can find you want something that's as light as a road bike but with somewhere in between the brakes and the capability of a mountain bike. So they've so slowly taken these things called cyclocross bikes, which were basically off-road uh, road bikes with road bike geometry. And they've sort of slackened the geometry towards mountain bikes a little more so that they become more stable and more enjoyable on long rides on the dirt so that's sort of the evolution as i see it as a gravel bike yeah because i used to race uh when i did the century advertiser i used to race it on a mountain bike with uh street tires uh-huh i've done that as well because i got tired of doing centuries on a road bike just saying well i know i can do it i just want to see if i can do it on a mountain bike now yeah. So I've done centuries in the past on mountain bikes and stuff. And cyclocross. Way, oh, go ahead. By the way, I had a friend. Uh, this was a bunch of years ago. Uh, she lived here on the big island. And uh, she wanted to do the Ironman. Uh, and I think she was going to be 41 or so at the time and said, I'm going to do the Ironman and I'm going to do the Xterra two weeks later. But I want to do the Ironman on my road, on, on my mountain bike. And they went, no, 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 no. Apparently that's, that's poo-pooed. Oh, I, I'm, I'm surprised because I knew, well, I've known, like Corey did it on a, a regular pedal bike, you know, with regular pedals and stuff and on a fixie. But, you know, huh, I wonder when that, uh, I'm sure it's an Ironman rule, you know, that yeah. it has to be a road bike, but that doesn't make sense. Yeah. I just remember she was so disappointed in that because I, you know, she was all excited she was going to be, she was going to do both events on the same bike. Okay. I was going to say, was she going to do Xterra on a road bike? No, that wouldn't happen. Uh -huh. <laughs> Well, I remember they had the, the one cyclocross event that I can remember was maybe three years ago now that Vern put on. Yeah, I remember that. I went out just for the hell of it. It was fun. I did it on, you know, one of my one of my mountain bikes because that's all I have. I, I got bored with road biking and I sold my road bike and I just own mountain bikes now. Yeah, it was too bad that, he, you know, everybody's, you know, everybody's working hard and everything, but, you know, it's too bad we couldn't keep up that series. And I've asked Todd Moronic to uh, do an interview, too, and I still remember Todd going up that hill to the soccer fields and just gracefully jumping off the bike and continuing on. It was like, I was amazed. <laughs> and here I, I was as a, as a mountain biker riding all of these things that people were getting off uh, because they they couldn't do it on dirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, oh, I didn't know that that was a something that you could do. Yeah, it's like, no. <laughs> Let's see. I'm trying to remember. Oh, 
What what's your best crash that you can remember? Oh, wow. There are many over the years. <laughs> <laughs> so I was in California once uh, riding with a bunch of my friends on one of my Sunday rides. And there was a trail that went around the back of a canyon and was coming down the other side along a ridge line. So on, on the right side, there's just sheer drop. And on, on the left side, it kind of just falls off. And I'm just, you know, there's one trail about so wide, just going down. And I remember going faster than I normally do on this trail because I just said, yeah, you know, I know this section really well. Where most people sort of just sort of make their way down slowly. I was just really flying down. But there was a rock there that wasn't there the week before. And I hit it with my front wheel, went over the handlebars. Uh, but my buddies and I have talked about this and said, you cannot rehearse this kind of stuff. And somehow going over the handlebars, I managed to step out of my pedals, step over the handlebar, and leave the bike behind me and be running down this, the trail with the bike tumbling behind me somewhere. Um, but eventually I ran out of space and I ran into this hole that was, you know, would just drop right down into the, uh, the, the cliff or whatever. But I just remember seeing it go by and I saw a chain link fence flash across my face and I just reached up and I grabbed onto it and I was hanging there because the, the trail had eroded such that the, uh, the posts holding the chain link fence in place had eroded away. So there was probably about 10 foot section of chain link fence out in the, you know, space. And I just managed to grab onto it and, and hang there. And people just said they thought that I just went over the cliff. And there I was just hanging, swinging there like that. Holy smokes. <laughs> And we just, and we still talk about it to this day because we say, you just can't rehearse something like that. Being able to, knowing you're going over the handlebars and being able to step off the pedals and, and step over the handlebar as your bike is going over. Did, did, did you just go, I meant to do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could, I can remember practicing like you said you can't rehearse it but more than once like you know uh when you come into Waikiki there's that gas station on the right and it's got like cobblestones yeah okay yeah, yeah. Oh, oh I got cut off by a tourist one time and hit the side of the car went over the hood you know myself <laughs> went over the hood basically landed you know did a little roll and landed with no problem because yeah I was kind of used to making little falls like that, but you can't right. you, know, you can't practice that. Yeah. Well, as a kid, I remember uh, hitting cars, you know, not being hit by cars, but hitting cars and rolling over the trunk or the hood of, of that person's car. And it's a, it's a valuable talent to have, you know, even running for me nowadays, because I fall when I run right. <laughs> is to figure out how to fall or at least uh, instinctively fall correctly. <laughs> oh yeah. And I actually had a, uh, it's it got a happy ending and stuff, but I had a good friend that I used to uh, bike with and stuff back in Colorado. And he was very adventurous on downhill single track. He ended up in the hospital very much damaged with like life-threatening injuries. This was about 10 years ago, but uh, he's recovery. So it's not, a, not an easy sport, not anything to be taken lightly. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, you know, that's the problem is the learning curve is steep. Mountain biking is not easy. Uh, it, you know, it, it takes, it takes, conditioning and it takes some level of skill so would you recommend because i just i sent you that email thank you for responding uh, a friend uh, she lives across the street here who wants to get into mountain biking how would you suggest if somebody goes you know i've been riding a road bike for years 
and I'm tired of riding on Queen K Highway, and I'd yeah. like to maybe, you know, do something else. Is there like a bottom end uh, as far as gearing, as far as what kind of bike, you know, maybe they should get into to start with without, we're, I'm assuming that most of our friends are not rich. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, uh, I didn't answer this in the email, but uh, my, my statement to that question that you just asked will be, if she wants to ride, put her in contact with people. She can contact me. And uh, we'll get a dialogue going and we'll say, hey, you know, yeah, let's go out and do some mountain biking. And, uh, you know, that's that's a dream of mine to get more and more and more people into mountain biking, especially families with kids so that it can become a whole family uh, um, activity. And that's one of the unfortunate things here on the island. We don't have uh, any, what I would consider beginner and beginner intermediate type mountain biking, but there are certainly venues for that where we can get people out and say, hey, let's go mountain biking. Uh, and before buying a bike, between collectively myself and a lot of us other mountain bikers in the community, we have extra bikes. We have bikes that can get, you know, that we can get our hands on to ride. So I consider that to be the, you know, the answer in the venue to get her involved with mountain biking. Yeah, networking to start out with for sure. But it, it, you really are right when you say that there's it's a steep learning curve here because there's no easy places to mountain bike other than like where I go around and stuff and a few places like that, which are more gravel road kind of yeah. areas. Right. I, I mentioned uh, Alex too, Can, uh, Candelaria uh, yeah. out at Anna's Ranch because yeah. he had no idea that you know, that was out there and stuff. I don't know. Do you know if Alex has opened up the trails behind the ranch there yet? No, I, I, I've been meaning to talk to him to say, hey, Alex, uh, what's the deal? You know, what's the status? And let's see if we can set something up. Let's see if we can coordinate something where I can say, hey, guys, this weekend, let's go ride at, you know, Alex's place and bring a group of 10 or so and say, hey, you know, It'll support Alex and it'll support, you know, and it'll give us something different to ride. Yeah, I noticed they had an art fair there this last weekend and and stuff. So maybe they're starting to open up some. I think he had the trails open for hikers. Okay. You did, you know, the social distancing and, right. you know, or, or, you know, whatever that you can do to stay safe. Have, right. you, have you noticed that anybody... To be honest, I haven't. No I've noticed a couple of people on bikes with masks. Have you noticed anybody out there with masks? No, I haven't. Yeah, knock on wood, we're pretty fortunate here. You know, of course, I always the videos that I do, I always say, you know, stay active, be outside, and be responsible. Right. Certainly, you know, we want want people. I'm like you. I'm a science guy. You know, mm -hmm. science is science are science is facts. There are no alternative <laughs> science. Right. <laughs> so I and, and as far as work goes, uh you guys were on leave for a while because of other issues. You know, right. I know up on Monica and stuff, but you guys you're back to work, so you spend what three days a week up on the mountain? So um uh Thankfully, we were only shut down for a few weeks um, with the uh, virus because we're, we're, we are considered non-essential in the you know, state of Hawaii, meaning we're not life-supporting, we're not uh, frontline. Uh, but we're also concerned with our uh, work environment because uh, you know, we, we don't want to contaminate our workspace. Um, because as soon as you get one person, uh, you know, sick in our work environment, you know, that could lead to just just a nightmare of, of uh, spreading it. But not only that, just, just the contamination and having to clean the place up after. Yeah. 
I've been using these for more than a few years, actually. Oops. Yeah. You know, UVC. I mean, because oh. I work computers and stuff, and I, I you know, got tired of catching uh, my clients' flu, basically. <laughs> right. So I, uh, you know, I would I do normal clean up, clean up and everything, but I've been using the the UVC for for a while, and you know, knock on wood, you know, yeah. you have to have to have safe practices now, and like you like you say with the families being confined and still getting out, it's kind of tough uh, to organize any group meetups like for a mountain bike ride. Right. Even though you're outside, you're, you know, it's easy. <laughs> We're on the big island. Thank goodness we have, uh, I don't want to call it social distancing. We have physical distancing yeah. as a matter of course. Right. Yeah, that's been one of the fortunate things about living here is uh, even, and even so out here in Waimea, we, you know, we're uh, a lot more remote than uh, other parts of the island. So yeah. that's been a blessing. And of so course, I've been working remotely uh, since, since then, uh, because fortunate enough uh, in December, January, we decided we were going to, uh, uh, contract a company out in New York to build a new piece of equipment for us. So I've been in the, in the works of, uh, with the group specifying the requirements and other important aspects of this, uh, unit that's being built for us. And, uh, um, I've been busy, uh, also trying to figure out how we're going to remote control and uh, do all the monitoring of this piece of equipment. So, you know, thankfully I've had this project uh, I've been working on nonstop. And then, so that's working from home. And just a few weeks ago, we started up observing again when the government, when the governor started opening, opening things that were not uh, non-essential, you know. So, um, that means that we started observing, so that means we have to do maintenance on the equipment again. Uh, so I've been going up once or twice a week now to uh, do this maintenance and uh, uh, reconfiguration of the observatory to do different kinds of observing. Well, that's, so not, that's mountain bike training, right? Be at altitude? Yeah. Or? yeah. <laughs> and now when we talk altitude how were uh, your office and work up there how what's the altitude there uh it's uh, almost 14,000 feet 4200 meters uh i don't do much riding but i sure do walk around the building a lot going up and down the stairwells i don't run you know that's that's one of the things i've it's it's interesting i've i've lost that desire to do any kind of running now that's because nobody's chasing you. That's all. Maybe that's what it is. <laughs> or you're not chasing somebody. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but no, I, I mean, uh, having lived at altitude in Aspen, which was 7,900 feet, uh -huh. you know, and having access to 14, 14 14ers and yes. you know, high passes and stuff, people don't realize how, how, um, taxing it can be on your system you know mm -hmm. and the same thing i think some people come here and they're kind of amazed that we have mountains <laughs> <laughs> well it is a unique situation because uh uh say you live in say you live in denver it's what a little over five thousand feet oh exactly one mile five thousand two hundred and eighty feet yeah so you start there and you spend time there you know you uh there aren't too many places in the world that you can go from sea level to 14,000 feet in two hours. Because most places you start at five, six, you know, 10,000 feet and you go up to that altitude. You know, um, what's that other one? Uh, Pikes Peak. Mm -hmm. You can drive up to Pikes Peak, but where do you drive from when you go up there? You're going to start at six, 7,000 feet before you get up there. So it's not like you're doing it in a matter of hours to go from sea level to that altitude. People don't realize that that's unique. Oh yeah, and uh, even um, when I was, I used to dive, 
and uh -huh. I did Kona and go for a dive. I had to kill time before driving to Waimea. Uh huh. Because I mean, even though we're three thousand feet, you know, here twenty five hundred to three thousand right. stuff, it was like, yeah, and I there was no way I could go up Mauna Kea or do anything like that the same day. Right. You just have to be safe. Yeah, we're lucky we have a race that uh, everything's been canceled this year. But the one race, the Siege Stars, which uh -huh. starts down in Waimea and goes up to the visitor center at, at uh, Mauna Kea, which is, that's only, what, 9,000 feet, 9,500? 9, feet, yeah. 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 Have you seen much traffic up there as far as, you know, like when you go to work and stuff? Has there been? No, not much. Mostly because we don't have the, you know, the, uh, the tourist volume coming in. But yeah, that place used to be a zoo. I could not believe how many hundreds of cars were parked there every evening when I was coming down for my work days. Oh, yeah, I had a, a friend of mine, uh, Kyle Kavai, uh, at his uh, uh, bachelor party. We actually, we stayed overnight at the cabins. And uh -huh. then for sunrise, we went up the mountain. And then went up to the went up to the telescopes and watched the sunrise. Kind of a uh, kind of a different uh, bachelor party, you might say. But that was yeah. that was what we did. <laughs> now let's mention some of the groups that we, uh, you and I talked a little bit beforehand uh, about the groups, the five hundred one c threes and the charities, and and that people can support uh, and help. Um, you know, educate our uh -huh. young people and get them interested in science uh-huh science yeah i love it you know <laughs> being an engineer and, and uh fascination with science i love it yeah what was it what was the nonprofit group that you mentioned earlier uh it was called monica scholars and they can be found at monicascholars.com okay write that down folks and what do they do? What is uh, kind of one of the areas that they uh, work in? Um, so uh, astronomy is research and requires an observatory with a telescope. Um, so most people that are doing astronomy are uh, PhDs at universities. Um, so unfortunately, most young people, uh, you know, I'll say uh, grade school, middle school, high school, don't have access to a telescope to do research. Um, but I do know of uh, at least two or three astronomers now that at the age of five years old said, boy, look at that sky up there. I, I want to be an astronomer. Uh, you know, seeing seeing what's up there in, in our sky at night, they actually knew that at five years old, they wanted to become an astronomer. So we have this uh, program here called Mauna Kea Scholars uh, that basically gives telescope time for research to high school students. And when you go to uh, science fairs in our state of Hawaii, um, you see all these really great science fair uh, projects. A lot, of in, a lot of them involve things like growing plants, um, you know, which is the best battery. You know, you can do research on that pretty easily, but there aren't any astronomy science fair projects. So, we realized this and uh, we've gotten together with our with the other observatories on the mountain and we are actually awarding uh, observing time on our telescopes to high school students who have good astronomy related programs and this is uh, directed toward you know for the students who are wanting to get into these engineering and astronomy type uh, fields, showing them that, you know, engineering isn't only about electrical engineering or mechanical or, you know, there's, there's a whole uh, field of physics and chemistry and astronomy out there that also fits into the STEM programs. So what, uh, again, what does uh, STEM stand for? 
uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, that's an amazing program. That's uh, high school students have access to world renown and uh, uh, equipment that is discovering amazing stuff. Right. Answering questions about where, you know, be, how did the universe get to be what it is? You know, as broad as that, there are so many areas of it, like how do planets form or how do galaxies form or how do black holes form? You know, all questions beyond myself because, you know, I'm an, I'm an engineer. I love fixing the thing and keeping it running. But there are people, you know, who wonder stuff like this and who want to figure it out. Uh, something like, is there another Earth-like planet out there? You know, that's that's the the simplest one that I see. Well, and, and you know, some of us were just wondering, what did I eat yesterday, or what am I going to eat tomorrow? Right. <laughs> but along that same line, you know, let's look at it this way: there are a lot of jobs out there that I don't want to do. Think about it. <clears throat> I work at a place in which I don't have to worry about how my medical uh, coverage is going to get paid for. Who's going to process my paycheck so that I can get paid and have the right deductions taken out so that the taxes get paid. Someone geeks out and gets excited about stuff like that. <laughs> and thank goodness that someone enjoys that because that's someone's job. Yeah, I mean, people, uh, you know, they see the top, but they don't see everything else that supports it, the pyramid uh, beneath it. Right, yeah. And that's why it's important that, you know, there are people that worry and wonder about this kind of stuff, because to them, it is important, and it is cool, you know, to answer these kinds of questions, to find solutions to what they are looking for. So getting, getting back to Earth a little bit and solutions and stuff, uh, do you have any projects ahead as far as mountain biking goes? Any ch is there anything on the island here specifically? Any trails that you're looking, you know, you don't have to say where, because I always tell people, let's not tell people across the board where things are, but is there anything, any trails that you're looking at, you know, fixing up in the next couple of years? No, no real goals on that. You know what my dream is? What? Somehow, some way we could establish a venue to have more trails for more people uh, to ride that can become a family activity. Uh, I ride with a bunch of people that I consider to be intermediate expert mountain bikers and I also ride with a, a number of beginners but even at a beginner level these people are more than your average cyclist. I'm looking for a venue in which we could get, say, a six-year-old, a seven-year-old, 10-year-old out mountain biking and have that big smile on their face. Yeah, I mean, I'm lucky enough to work for PATH, you know, and we're, of course, everything that we've been doing lately is pretty much shut down because of COVID-19. Right. But yeah, I mean, the, the, that's an area that either PATH or somebody else, you know, uh, uh, the Daniel Sayer Foundation or, you know, maybe some other foundation can help out with. Because as I've learned, there's been more and more people asking me personally for stuff because there's more cakeys now who are out riding their bikes. You know, we have sort of exactly. ex right. extended summer vacation here. Right. Yeah. So something other than riding the bike up and down the, you know, the, the street, you know, of, of the neighborhood. Hey, let's go out and explore somewhere. Uh, wouldn't it be great to load the bikes up and go and ride somewhere and, and, and do some exploring uh, instead of just riding up and down the street somewhere? And, and the corollary would be, you know, where, where I run, there's a lot of people who are out on ATVs which uh -huh. you know, gets, gets you out, you don't, I mean, you sit there and, and go like this to right. get out there. 
And I'm not saying that's not healthy, but I think it would be great to get it so that uh, you actually have to be healthy and uh, use your own muscles and exercise to get there. Right, right. And again, this activity has taken me all over the road to ride and meet people from all over the road, trails all over the road. Uh, it's an amazing experience to be able to share and, and ride with people from all walks of life, all ages. Uh, you know, and we all had that big smile on our face. My, my buddy in California has, has created this quote, on a mountain bike, you can be nine years old forever. And he's 76 this year. Excellent, excellent. I, I, I think maybe that's a, that's a good uh, way to, uh, to end our interview. I can't thank you as much as I can for the, your time. You're a busy dude. Uh, the fact that you've been able to take, you know, a, a little over an hour here to almost an hour and a half to talk to us. And I think that's a, a great sentiment. Uh, and what's your friend's name again? His your name buddy. is Troy Braswell. Okay, shout out to Troy. All right, and Troy, yeah. Shout out to Troy. <laughs> shout out to Grant and Janet for all that they do on the island. Shout out to Path. You know, yeah, uh, yeah it's absolutely they, Path. And, yeah. and, a, and a big shout out to, uh, to, to Grant, <laughs> you, <laughs> for be, being willing to uh, put up with me for an hour and oh, stuff and, and help share. Yeah. So again, <laughs> thanks, Grant. Aloha. Aloha. Thanks, man. Good talk. Well, I kind of, I kind of got Grant off there. I clicked the wrong button. Sorry uh, that my uh, eyesight, as you can see, uh, needs a little adjustment. But yeah, I didn't mean to end it so abruptly there on Grant. But uh, I want to thank him. Uh, much aloha and mahalo to him for taking the time today. He's, dude is a busy guy. And I'm glad that we had a chance to talk and talk about mountain bikes and talk about Hawaii and talk about science and talk about uh, so many things that I think are important nowadays that we share. And I want to make sure, i am use my glasses now, that monikeascholars.com, uh, that you can visit that site. It sounds like a great, a great opportunity for um, high school kids and to be able to get access to such a, uh, an incredible resource that we happen to have here in Hawaii. But again, if you wanna support the show, you can also uh, subscribe on YouTube. You can find us at hawaiiultra.com. We're on Stitcher, we're on uh, iTunes, we're, uh, we have a Facebook page. So again, uh, we're just hoping to bring the stories uh, that need to be told nowadays and hoping again that you are out there staying active and uh, being responsible and staying safe. Aloha.